What a joy to open the scriptures together as well. If you have a Bible or a Bible on your phone, I'd love you to find Genesis chapter 39. We're going to be looking together a bit about the life of Joseph. And um, I want to begin by suggesting that it's really important in our walk with God, it's really important as we open the scriptures to be honest, isn't it? But sometimes honesty can be uncomfortable. The story is told of uh, a young guy who was starting his career as a lawyer in the South in America, and it was in Mississippi, and he was conducting his first trial. He was He was the prosecution attorney, and he felt a bit nervous as he called his first witness to the stand, and she was a rather grandmotherly, elderly lady, and she came to the stand, and he thought, I'll do a really easy question for her to get her to relax, so he said, Mrs. Jones, do you know me? She said, oh, yes, uh, Mr. Williams, I've known you since you were a boy, and frankly, you've been a big disappointment to me. She said, you lie, you cheat, you manipulate people behind their backs, and you have never had the intelligence to realise that you'll never amount to more than a two-bit paper pusher. Yes, I know you. The lawyer was just so appalled, he didn't know what to do. So he pointed across the court and he said, do you know the defence lawyer, Mr Bradley? And she said, oh, yes, I've known Mr. Bradley since he was a youngster. He's lazy, bigoted, and he has a drinking problem. He can't build a normal relationship with anyone. His law practice is one of the worst in the entire state. And what's worse, he's cheated on three different women, and one of them was your wife. Yes, I know him. The defense lawyer, Mr. Bradley, nearly died. At that point, the judge asked both lawyers to approach the bench, and he said in a quiet voice, If either of you two idiots asks her if she knows me, I'll send you both to electric chair. (laughs) Honesty can be difficult, can't it? It can be hard. And I don't know how your last three years have been. We've had a pandemic. We've had lockdown. We've had a massive economic crisis, a fuel crisis, cost of living crisis. We've got war on the borders of Europe and a refugee crisis. Many of us in this space will have gone through job loss, perhaps illness, cancer tests, miscarriage, infertility, mental health collapses, either of ourselves or of those we love and are close to, bereavement. I'm certain that in this room this morning, there are many stories of pain and trauma. Now, the amazing thing is that when we read God's word, when we open God's word, we don't do that in a vacuum. God's word actually speaks to us in reality. And that is true both personally and also into the cultural moment we find ourselves in. The New York Times describes our moment in history, the word describing our moment as languishing. That's the word for the moment for them. It's as if we're we're experiencing this kind of deep malaise as things that we have relied on economically, culturally, environmentally, perhaps personally, are shaken. And when hard and devastating things happen, it can be difficult. It can shake us to the core. And I think that is especially true If we have been raised to think of faith as in some way protecting us on a relentlessly upbeat path to success, as if faith doesn't also involve walking through valleys of suffering and trial. But what we see in the scriptures and what we're going to see in the scriptures this morning is that our God speaks into enters into the suffering world that you and I experience and know. Our God is about reality and not fantasy. So let's turn to the book of Genesis. The context, if you don't know, um, there's this guy called Joseph. He's born into a family with a lot of brothers. His father is a guy called Jacob. And out of all of the brothers, he loves Joseph the most. And slightly unwisely, from a parental point of view, he shows that by giving Joseph a visibly superior coat, a coat with lots of colours that makes him stand out. 
So the brothers are jealous. They, they don't like this for understandable reasons. And the father um, treats Joseph with preferential treatment. Now, Joseph, also on top of his human father's preference, also experiences dreams from God. And those dreams seem to say to him that he is going to one day exercise leadership in an amazing way, including over his family. And his brother's like that even less when he rather unhelpfully shares that dream with them. As a result of that, the brothers, one day when Joseph comes to them, they end up Set, they think about killing him, but they don't do that. They sell him to slave traders who are passing by. So this is where we pick up the story, chapter 39. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered. And he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. And Potiphar put him in charge of everything, of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. And from the time he put him in charge of his household and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. And so Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. And now Joseph was well built and handsome. That last verse is one of my friend's favorite verses in the Bible to speak of, you know, what it like, is like to be a man of God. Now, I wonder, without the sort of preamble about suffering, without the experience of slavery, if you were to open the Bible at Genesis 39 and just begin to read, and this is what you hear about Joseph, I wonder what you'd feel about him. The Lord was with Joseph, verse 2. The Lord was with Joseph, verse 3. The Lord gave him success in everything he did, verse 3. Joseph found favour in his eyes, verse 4. Verse 5, he was put in charge of everything, verse 6. Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care with Joseph in charge and he was well built and handsome. I wonder who of us in this room like this guy at this moment. Now, when we hear about a person like Joseph, who is in charge, in charge, in charge, under the blessing of God, I wonder how you feel about that. Perhaps some in this room think God's blessing is coming. I want to get in the stream of it, his power, his influence, God's meaning, God's purpose. When we hear about that kind of power, we feel exhilarated, we feel excited. Others of us in this room when we hear about this, we'll feel mildly irritated or stronger. We think there are always those hashtag blessed people who are gifted and good looking and in charge of everything. They're like Joseph and, and not like me. Perhaps our relationship to power is more complex. Perhaps we don't care about it that much or we're wary of power. After all, We've come to know through brutal personal experience that people who have power are dangerous. People who are in, those kind of in charge of everything types of people, we know we need to be cautious around them. Now, of course, you know that Joseph's relationship with power is going to be complex He'd been sold as a slave by his brothers. He'd been trafficked to another country, Egypt. He'd been then sold by his traders to an Egyptian official. And now he's working as the slave in the house of a powerful man in the Egyptian empire. Joseph has experienced this catalogue of abuse. Now chapter 39 comes and he begins to be on the up. He's beginning to experience the favor and blessing of God. He's beginning to be trusted and put in charge of things. He's be beginning 
to maybe think to himself, finally, my breakthrough might be coming. Perhaps I've left my trauma behind. Perhaps I've broken through. But no, in the story, this is not the breakthrough moment. Having been enslaved, having gone through everything that we've seen him go through, now he's in Potiphar's house. He then, if you read on in this chapter, gets falsely accused of sexual assault. Potiphar's wife takes a liking to this very well-built and handsome man, and she wants to sleep with him. Joseph says no, so she accuses him of rape. And as a result of that, he's sent to prison. Now, I just want to ask you how you feel now about suffering and how you feel about that kind of experience that Joseph might be going through. His family have sold him out. He has no contact with them. He's been abused by them. He's been enslaved. And now, on top of it all, he's being shamed, abused, imprisoned, abandoned, and traumatized once again. What we see from this in the scriptures is that the way that God moves and works in this world does not look or feel like the survival of the fittest. And it doesn't look or feel like what the great European philosophers, people like the atheist philosophers like Nietzsche, would say, the hope of the ubermensch, the powerful superman, the human strong man. The way of the scriptures is that a person who is called to steward great spiritual authority, a person who will see breakthrough and influence for God's kingdom is a person who knows what it is to suffer, to be traumatized, to be falsely accused to be betrayed, to be sold out by family or people we thought were family, to go through an experience of oppression where people misuse their power against us and to still end up loving a broken world. A person called to great authority in God's kingdom like Joseph, does not end up loving a broken world as something external to them. Brokenness and suffering that they observe. A person who is called to great kingdom authority and breakthrough doesn't experience suffering as an external thing they look at, but is a person who walks through suffering and trauma. Now, trauma is a a really important word in our cultural moment. You might hear that word a lot. And the experts tell us that trauma is not the terrible thing that happened to you. It's what happens inside of you as a result of what happened to you. In his book, The Body Keeps the Score, the psychologist, he was involved as their first team to diagnose what we now call PTSD, to see that cluster of symptoms. He's called Bessel van der Kolk. He says this, trauma is an inability to inhabit one's body without being possessed by its defenses and the emotional numbing that shuts down all experience. He specializes in the relationship between the human body and human trauma responses. And what we see here as we begin to dig into the text of the scriptures is that the Bible is trauma-informed. It isn't just or only emotional and psychological abuse that Joseph experiences. He also experiences that in a body in the real physical world. And when, um, when you go through that, when you have a traumatic experience, what your body experiences matters as well as what your emotions go through. Now, as a personal disclosure, I am a survivor of trauma. And I want to say this morning, Katie, and I believe this is really important, 
that there is no shame in being a person who has survived and experienced trauma. In fact, this very hero of the Bible that we're talking about today is a trauma survivor, Joseph. And the telling of Joseph's story at all, and the inclusion of the deep wounds and disappointments that he goes through tells us something about the God of the Bible. And that is that he is trauma-informed. The God of the Bible looks and sees and knows and includes those who walk through trauma in the redemption story. In other words, in the Christian faith, there is no empty triumphalism and there is no religiosity that tells us we must pretend when we're suffering. The telling of Joseph's story at all is deeply powerful and deeply healing. So why does it matter to us thousands of years later, you know, 21st century Notting Hill, here we are, talking about a life lived a long time ago. What I want to suggest to you this morning that the reason this matters is deeply theological. You see, theologically, there's no mistake in how the book of Genesis was put together and how it was written. As the book of Genesis unfolds, there are these um, seven individuals who are very significant in the history of our faith. And they are Adam, Abel, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then Joseph. Now, if you come to think of it, Adam, the first man to ever live. Abraham, the father of the faith, the father of the people of God. You know, these are quite significant figures, right? Now, as you look at the text of Genesis, what you will see is that far more chapters are devoted to the life of Joseph than any of the others. Moses thought it was really important that we, the people of God, dwell on the life of Joseph. Why? Well, people's theologians suggest two reasons. The first possibility is that the life of Joseph bridges Genesis to Exodus. And Exodus is really important. It's the book about how the people of God move out of slavery in Egypt and go to the promised land, right? And Joseph tells us how they ended up in Egypt in the first place. That's one possibility. But surely the real reason why the life of Joseph is described in such fullness and detail is because almost everything in his life is a living prophecy of Jesus Christ. Now you'll know that in the Old Testament there are loads of prophecies about the coming of Christ in history. Prophecies from Isaiah, prophecies from Micah who who prophesied where the Messiah would be born in a tiny place called Bethlehem. Prophecies from King David. But what we have in the life of Joseph is prophecy lived out. Joseph, as he walks through trauma and emerges as this hero of the faith, as he emerges as someone who is called to exercise great power and authority, is actually pointing us to Jesus. Let me show you how. Firstly, Joseph points us to Jesus because he is the beloved son of the loving father. You see this in in Genesis very clearly that Joseph is the beloved son who is, who, who is his father's delight. He's given that coat. There's this passionate portrait of a loving father. And in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 17, this is how God the Father speaks of Jesus the Son as he's being baptized. He says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So Joseph points us to Jesus by being the beloved son. Secondly, Joseph points us to Jesus by being sent by the Father on a mission of mercy and welfare for the brothers, for the others. Jacob sends Joseph with food and provisions to go out and meet the brothers as they're looking after the flocks. In in chapter 37 of Genesis, you see that. And in John's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 17, we read, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. So there's a beloved son loved by the father who is sent into the world. 
Then thirdly, Joseph is sold. He's sold to Midianite merchants. And they pay for him, in chapter 37, verse 28, they pay for Joseph with silver coins. Now, it's really striking that it's one of the brothers, one of the sons of Jacob who does the deal. And his name is Judah. Scroll forward a few years, and one of Judah's descendants, Judas, would sell the Lord Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Joseph points us to Jesus, the beloved son sent into the world for love of the world, who is sold for pieces of silver. Joseph then points us to Jesus by serving as a slave. We read about that just now. He's in Potiphar's house. And we see the way the Apostle Paul describes who Jesus is in Philippians. In this way, he says, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very form of a servant, or in the Greek, bond slave. So Jesus, coming into this world, takes the form of a servant, and Joseph points us to him in that. Then fifthly, we see that Joseph resists the seduction of sin. Joseph resists the advances of Potiphar's wife. And he's foreshadowing the temptation of Jesus. And Jesus is resisting of the temptation in the wilderness as as Satan tempts him. So Joseph and Jesus are the beloved son sent into the world, sold into slavery, serving as a slave, resisting seduction. And then sixthly, Joseph is falsely imprisoned. He's shackled. He's falsely accused and he remains silent in the face of accusation. Does that sound familiar to anyone who's read the New Testament? Just as Joseph, though completely innocent, was thrown into prison, so Jesus Christ remains silent at his trial in the face of his accusers. Now, striking even more, I think, is the parallel between Potiphar and Pilate. Pilate knew Jesus was innocent. He says famously, I find no fault in him. And Potiphar knew Joseph was innocent. How do we know that? If a slave had attempted to rape your wife, you wouldn't send them to prison in ancient Egypt. They would definitely have been executed. Potiphar knew Joseph was innocent. Then seventhly, we see Joseph suffering in that prison. Psalm 105 speaks of the suffering of Joseph. He sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold as a slave, and they bruised his feet with shackles, says verse 17 of Psalm 105. And this points us to Jesus. This is prophetic of the suffering of the Son of God, who is falsely accused and then scourged and crowned with thorns and nailed to a cross. Now we see that Joseph won the respect of his jailer, chapter 39, verse 21 of of Genesis. And in the same way, Jesus Christ wins the respect of the centurion who is overseeing his crucifixion. Now a centurion was someone who'd reached a particular rank in the Roman army, They were experienced at executing criminals. This is not his first gig. So when he's there for yet another crucifixion, and this this Roman centurion says, in Luke's Gospel, chapter 23, verse 47, surely this was a righteous man. We have an echo of what we saw with Joseph. Joseph is pointing us to Jesus. Joseph suffered in prison between two sinners. They were a butler or a wine taster and a baker. And they were in prison with him together. The Lord Jesus suffered between two criminals. The two people that Joseph suffered alongside, one ended up being released and going on to great things. The butler, not so much the baker. And the two criminals suffering alongside Jesus, one of them hurled insults upon him and the other 
said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth, today, today, you will be with me in paradise. So Joseph suffers between two criminals and he's the means of blessing for one and judgment for the other. Just as the Lord Jesus suffers between two criminals and one goes to paradise. Joseph points us through his trauma and suffering to the Lord Jesus. The one who is the beloved son who is sent into this world for love of us who is sold and serves as a slave and uh, resists seduction, is shackled and suffers, and then lastly, is raised to save. You see, Joseph is delivered from prison by the hand of God. The moment we picked up the story, the reading, it wasn't quite that moment of, of, of salvation and being raised up. This, that comes later when he's released from prison. It's only when the Pharaoh has a troubled spirit and has dreams that his magicians are unable to interpret that the butler suddenly recalls the Hebrew dream interpreter that he'd been in prison with and brings him to Pharaoh. And Joseph is able to interpret the Pharaoh's dream. And as a result of that, they store up grain which um, is then a provision for, the, for when the famine actually comes. So Joseph is raised up for a purpose. He's raised in order to save. And that is prophetic, of course, of Jesus' resurrection. And because of who Jesus is, because of the one we are shaped by, the one we follow as Christians, We follow a saviour who's a beloved son, who was sent and sold, who served as a slave, seduction resisted, who is shackled and suffers and then is raised to save. And because of who Jesus is, the whole life of Joseph pointing to that truth and reality, because of who Jesus is, That speaks to who we are called to be in this suffering world. Because of God, Joseph is able to say to God, you have made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. And that, because of Jesus, can be true for us today. You see, Jesus Christ, by going through the trauma of the cross, can change our suffering into something beautiful and redemptive. Jesus Christ, by being the one who is enthroned and the Lord of all, and being the one who was traumatised and crucified, he can be safe and good to handle power. And Joseph and Jesus point us to that today. Abuse by people in power is utterly devastating. Some of us will have experienced it firsthand. We see it in the institutions, politically, in companies, even in the church, sadly. We, We see examples of the abuse of power. But what Joseph shows us is that the way of the kingdom, the way of the kingdom is the way of suffering, yes. But our suffering is redeemed. And Joseph goes on to have enormous responsibility. Jesus is raised from the grave, but Joseph is raised up in his generation to bring food and salvation to a perishing world. Genesis chapter 41 verse 55 says, All Egypt began to feel the famine, and the people cried to Pharaoh for food. And Pharaoh told the Egyptians, Go to Joseph and do whatever he tells you. So having suffered, having gone through abuse and trauma, 
Joseph is now a safe leader, a trustworthy leader who will not abuse this power, a servant leader like Jesus, a wounded leader who understands trauma and who has offered forgiveness to the perpetrators of his great harm, his own brothers. Joseph becomes the safe place and the safe person for a starving world. So the image of Joseph as the one raised to save is him giving food to the perishing. It's a beautiful image of what the gospel is. Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. Anyone who eats of this bread will never go hungry. It's a beautiful picture of that, but it is also a pattern for us as believers. Our suffering, our trauma does not put us on the shelf. It does not take us out of the game of God's kingdom. We don't follow Nietzsche who says you must be the strong man, the one who takes power. We follow Jesus who is the suffering, traumatized saviour who is empower, empowers us with love in a broken world and redeems the suffering that you and I go through. Joseph becomes a saviour to all peoples, all the countries around Egypt came to eat that food. And Joseph's resources are enough to meet the need of all. Genesis chapter 41 verse 49, Joseph stored up huge quantities of grain like the sand of the sea. And it was so much that they stopped keeping records. Even the bureaucrats stopped counting it. There was so much of it. How abundant is God's provision that there was enough, not just for one country, but all the nations of the world. And enough so that records needed to be stopped kept being kept. And Joseph does not seek to control the flow of resource. He trusts the abundance of God and holds light to his own power. This is prophetic of Jesus' king, um, kingdom, his provision for us, but also of who we are in Christ and how we are called to live and operate. Yes, we may walk through valleys of trauma and suffering and pain and loss, and those are not denied or skirted over. In fact, the Lord Jesus walks that path of suffering for us and with us. But yes, we are also called to be those who are raised up, raised to offer the salvation of this Lord to a perishing and starving world. Joseph's t story tells us that safe, powerful authority will have suffered. I wonder if there are some who need to hear this morning that your trauma might be the crucible of your breakthrough. The resources that Joseph had were this massive storehouse of grain. But what about us? What are the resources of the kingdom? Resources for creatively reimagining economics in a starving world. Resources for preaching the gospel in a broken world. Resources for the healing shalom of God to flow in a traumatized world where people are set free from addiction and the powers that have oppressed. Resources to feed the spiritually hungry in a starving world, a million of whom are going to pass your doors next weekend. Resources for physical food in the hunger crisis we see in the world. God's storehouse is full, says the Word of God. God's storehouse is full and we need only ask to receive. We are called to be the vessels like Joseph through whom that provision for the world flows. And I believe, um, Kensington Temple, KT, that God is calling this church to be a storehouse for this city. The Spirit of the living God upon this church flowing through you, you as raised to save, even though all the traumas you've been through, even all the suffering you've walked through, that helping you and making you safe people through whom the resource of God might flow to this city. Leadership and safe authority trusts the resources of God. So as I close, 
if there are any in this room today who are victims of trauma, you've been through real suffering and harm. I sense God is saying to you today, you are needed. You are not on the sideline. You can be a vessel of Christ because you might be able to be a safe handler of power in our generation through Christ, the beloved son who was sent and sold, who was a servant of all, who resisted seduction, who was shackled and imprisoned and suffered crucifixion and was raised to save. It's through him. And because of him, You and I, even in our trauma, can serve a starving and needy and traumatized world.